Okay. <clears throat> well, welcome back. And uh, we're going to start. And we're going to start with uh, the business model canvas. Before we start, are there any questions on the first section that we saw, which was the customer segments and value propositions? No, no questions. Okay. Well, I'm going to share my screen so we could start on the second part of, of this uh, workshop. And uh, I always like to start up reminding all of you about uh, your business model and your business model, its uh, main objective is to create value, deliver value and capture value. And the business model canvas helps you to think out that whole process. And today we are going to start with the uh, the third building block called channels. And channels and customer relationships go hand in hand, and they are very key to the success of your business model because these are your links between your value proposition, your branding, and your customer segments. And when, we're, when we are talking about channels, we are talking about the customer touch points <clears throat> or customer interfaces. And, and these are the means through which you communicate with your customers or the means through which you deliver your value proposition. And when we're talking about channels, we have to think about five different phases that are very important uh, for all small businesses especially small businesses um, that are um, are just starting up, uh, you really have to think about the first phase. So let, let's look at this. Um, but um, now when we're talking about channels, we have to think about your channels, your specific channels of your business model are, are your channels going to be direct or indirect channels? And it depends. Uh, if, if somebody is uh, working through Etsy or through um, Pinterest or through Amazon, well, your channels might be indirect. But if you are a brick and mortar, if you have a website and you're selling direct, your services or your products, then you have a direct channel because you are reaching your customers through your own store, through your own website, through your uh, social media, through Salesforce or other means. But if you are partnering with a different organization, a different um, uh, it, like Amazon or Etsy or other uh, organizations, then you are uh, reaching out to your customers in an indirect channel uh, because the connection is between Amazon and your, cust uh, your customer segments. So that's why they're called third party stores or third party websites or third party mobile channels and then um, some organizations or businesses, they have uh, uh, wholesalers or uh, sales uh, force that are outside and then and they're indirect. And that's why, so you have to think about when we're talking about your channels for your specific business model, are your channels direct or indirect? And then once you know if they're indirect or direct, you have to think about the five phases that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I just uh, briefly mentioned that there are five phases, but these are the five phases 
that you have to think about. The, this is what is called the customer journey. And so this is the customer journey map. And you have to think about within the, each of these touch points, how am I going to connect my value proposition or my business model or my brand or my identity with the customer segments? And so this is where you have to think about, okay, the first phase, the first phase is called awareness. This is, if you are a new business, this is a key phase because you have to establish that awareness. You have to do a marketing uh, plan in order to reach out to the potential customer segments. And this is where you have to think about your customer segments and who they are. And that's why we talked about last week about getting to know your customer segments because you will know who they are and how they want to be reached. What are those touch points? Is it through social media that you are going to establish uh, awareness or is it through a website or is it through printed material? It just depends who your customer segments are. Um, right now I'm working with the small business and they are going to be working with um, bigger companies. And so their awareness um, really has to be focused on printed material in order to get this material to HR, human resources, or to people who make decisions within these companies. And, and this is where you have to think about the awareness phase how am I going to establish awareness about my product or my service during this space? And this is very important for you to think about. What are, are the channels? What are the touch points? What are the means that will help me connect and bring, out, bring about awareness uh, within the customer segments? And after you create awareness, you have to think about evaluation. Evaluation is a phase where you have, where the customers, potential customers know about your product, but then they compare it to other products or other comp competition within your customer, within your market base, within your business model. And so if you are a restaurant, they will compare with other restaurants. If you are a graphic designer, they will compare with other graphic designers. If you are a nonprofit, they will compare with other nonprofit. And what they want to know is who will give the best results for what they are seeking out of a value proposition. And so this is that evaluation phase. What some businesses do is within their own websites, or within their own social media, they'll make a comparison chart. And they'll say, we as a small business offer all of these services and add-ons. Now, the others, the competitors, usually just offer this, 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 and this, but we offer five more added areas that we take into account for you as a customer. And we help out. And so you have to think about, okay, what is it that makes my business unique? What sets my business apart from the others? What, where is, is it that I stand out? I'll give you a, a comparison. I was working with a lawnmower company um, they're lawnmower, but they are also, uh, they uh, uh, trim trees, cut trees, and tree removal, and other aspects. Well, their business model distinguished them because he had the certifications that were needed in order to be um, a certified tree removal, and he the, his business was insured. And so 
even other lawn mowing companies would come to his business and ask for their certifications to be used under their businesses in order for them to do certain jobs within their business market. And so this is how he is able to stand out. And when he does his evaluation phase and he lets people know about his business, he talks about tree removal, he talks about trimmings, he talks about landscaping, but he also adds on certifications that other companies or competitors do not have. And, and this is what makes his business stand out among the rest. And, and so that's why it's important. You're thinking about your awareness, awareness phase, which is uh, the initial uh, establishing your customer segments and, and customer segments getting to know who you are and what you do. And then your evaluation phase where the customer segments check and see what's the difference between your business model and the competition. And th this is why I always recommend, if possible, to have some kind of an evaluation or comparison graphics within your own website, within your own social media posts, so that when the customer segments are seeking out and, 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 and trying to make a decision it, to choose you over others, they won't leave your website because everything will be there for them. Any questions they have will be answered through that uh, evaluation phase. So you have to think about that evaluation phase and how you're going to set it up in order to compare yourself to competitors. And when I talk about this with uh, small businesses, I tell them you don't have to put the name of your competitors. You could just put the title of others or similar businesses um, and, and just put the characteristics of these similar businesses and what they offer and what you offer and what makes your small business unique from the rest. And so these two initial phases are very important in order to start bringing in those customer segments and taking them to the third phase, which is the sales, where they have made the decision to buy your product or to buy your services. And the next one would be the delivery. So the sales phase, you would have to think about, okay, what is the touch point? How are my customer segments going to pay? Is it a brick and mortar store or is it uh, is everything digital? And is it a POS system that will be used? So you have to think about, okay, the sales phase, how will that touch point be? How will my customer segments finish up that sales and make the payment in my business model? And then the next phase would be the delivery. If you are a brick and mortar store, you don't have to worry because you know that they will come in and pick up. But during COVID-19, you have to think about delivery also, not just about coming into the store, but maybe having a, a parking space, a special for customers where you can go and deliver the product directly to them so they don't have to come into the store or they don't have to have any um, uh, uh, hands-on experience uh, avoiding COVID-19 or other aspects. So you have to think about in the delivery phase, what does this uh, imply? What is this uh, about? Am I just going to be delivery where they come and pick up? It, do they come into the store or to the business? Do I have a delivery system where if I am a restaurant, do I have somebody that delivers my products? One business in, in, in that during COVID-19, they pivoted their business. And in this pivot, what they did is they expanded the delivery. 
from not just citywide, they the, uh, started the business model of having delivery countywide. And they would deliver countywide and they expanded their weekend hours as a restaurant, not to be open, but just exclusively for delivery and their sales just exploded because they opened up their restaurant for delivery on Fridays and Saturdays from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. And so there were very few restaurants that were doing that. So their sales just exploded during COVID-19 and that pivot uh, really, really uh, made, uh, made the, made the uh, uh, was why they were successful. <clears throat> And so you have to think of in your delivery phases, how are your touch points going to be? And then uh, some businesses that had to um, close up their businesses like gyms or uh, other health uh, um, environment, uh, health businesses, physical exercise. They, what they started was uh, subscriptions to webinars and uh, video uh, trainings. And so this was a pivot of their business. And so you have to think about to be prepared for times like COVID-19, but you also have to think about now that we are coming out of COVID-19, what do customers expect? So you have to think about, okay, how is delivery gonna be done? How are those touch points going to be accomplished from my product service to my customer segments. And then the fifth phase is key because you have to think about what is your business model going to do after sales? Because you don't want just customers that come in once and don't ever come back. You have to um set up a system sort of the way that if you go to stores nowadays and they'll ask you if you want to be on their listing to receive coupons or special offers and they ask for your email your telephone sometimes your physical location and so this is something that you might want to set up. If you go to certain websites and if you're leaving the website, they'll, add, they'll, they'll let, uh, there'll be a pop-up and telling you, if you want the latest information, if you want to get uh, special offers, put in your email, put in your name, and we will get this information to you. And so that's one way of after sales that you can continue to market to your customer segments. So you have to think about what touch points are you going to create after sales? What, how is it that you are going to win back uh, for your customers? As this yellow arrow, you can see it's a continuum. So you want them to continue. You want them to come back and to buy and to upsell. So you have to think about how does that after sales phase look like in order for you to continue to have that relationship, long-term relationship with your customer segments. And so these are the five phases of all customer journeys, journey maps. You have the awareness phase, you have the evaluation phase, you have the sales phase, you have the delivery phase, and you have, the, you have the after sales phase. So your business model, what you're gonna do today when we pause for 20 minutes, think about it. How, what are, going, what are those touch points going to be? How are you going to be connecting with your customer segments? If you are just starting up, thinking of potential customer segments. If you are an established business, you think about your potential customers, but you also think about your long-term long -term customers. 
and how are you going to establish these touch points in order for this to continue and for customer segments to come back and customer segments, not just to come back, but you want word of mouth to for more customer segments, for customer segments to talk to their relatives, to their family, to friends, to uh, coworkers, and talk about their experience with your business model, with your value proposition. So you have to think about this and, and that's what you'll do um, once we pause. But right now, I just wanted to share channels. You have five phases that you have to think about. The awareness phase, evaluation phase, sales phase, delivery, and after sales. And these are the important touch points in order for your business to be a long-term success. And during the channels phase, you have to think about two questions. One, how can I reach my customers? But two, and this is, came about to be very true during the COVID-19 uh, disruption, how do my customers want to be reached? And now that we are coming out of COVID-19 and coming into a phase that is called the recovery phase, you have to think about, okay, how do my customers want to be reached during the recovery phase? How will that look like? Because what you will see is that customers, some customers may want to still stick to the touch points that were up during COVID-19. But some other customer segments may want to have those personalized experiences. So you have to think about and think about your specific customer segments and get to know them and get to know what they prefer as touch points. How do they want to be reached during these five different phases? So really your homework is to go out and talk to your customer segments and potential customer segments and ask them these questions about these different phases and then study what successful businesses are doing and how they're going about during uh, uh, establishing these touch points, these channels during these five different phases of the customer journey map. So you have to think about that. And, and, and that's part of your homework to keep working on the channels. Now, when we talk about channels, we, we, we also have to talk about customer relationships. And that's why customer relationships and channels are right next to each other. And they are the ones in between your value proposition and your customer segments. So you have to th think about when we're talking about customer relationships, it's also the link between value proposition and customer segments. And remember, channels are the touch points, are the means through which you are connecting with your customer segments. Customer relationships are the type of links that you establish between your organization and each customer segment. It describes the nature of the relationship. It describes the type of interaction that you establish with your customers. And it specifies how you acquire, retain, and grow customers. And as we mentioned, customer relationships is based on your channels also building block. So it's very important when you think about customer relationships and channels, they go hand in hand. One is the means, the touch points, and customer relationships are the links. And when we talk about customer relationships, there are four themes that you have to think about that will help you define your business model 
your customer relationships with your customer segments. And the first theme is the type of relationship. <clears throat> the type of relationship can vary from indirect to direct. When we're talking about an indirect relationship is where customers only deal with intermediaries. And when we're talking about direct, customers only deal with you or somebody from your business. And so you have to think about it and you have to think about it in terms of your five different phases that we talked about in the channels. So we can think about sales and maybe your sales will be indirect because the customers are not dealing direct with your company, but they go through a POS system or they go through uh, a digital system, a credit card system that there is no touch point with you directly, but it is with a third party that they make their payments. And deliveries sometimes may be through a third party also, where it might be that company is the one that is in charge of delivering the products that you, uh, that a, a customer segment has bought from your business. So you have to think about during the five phases, uh, are they direct or indirect? And think about, uh, is it totally direct or is it somewhere in the middle? And just think about it. It varies from business model to business model. And then the second theme that we are talking about is the type of bond that is established with the customers. Now, bond can vary from transactional to long-term. <clears throat> when we're talking about transactional, we're talking about a very loose bond, a temporary bond um, where customers come and go. And this you might have in a big box store. This is the type of bond that is established. Um, you will have transactional customers, but you may have long-term customers that where you have established a loyalty program and they keep coming back. But there may be customers that are transactional and just come what, for what they need and they leave and they won't come back in months or they might not come back at all. So you have to think about your business model. Is it transactional or is it long-term? Long-term is where there's a very tight bond with your customer. And you establish that tight bond be, be, be by way of your channels in order where you make it hard for your customer segments to leave because they see your brand. They see your the customer experience that they receive from your value proposition. They see the customer service. They see the long-term care that they receive from you. They see how you inform them, you educate them, and you um, are always showing them something new, teaching them, especially if you have a services business model and you are equipping your customer segments. And so they keep coming back because they uh, have built, you have built a trust within this customer segment. So you have to think about, okay, is it transactional or is it long-term or is it somewhere in between? But think about what type of bond you want to establish and how will you go about it? And that's where the channel phase is very important that you establish those five phases and strengthen them in order for the customer segments to always continue to come back because you want a long-term bond 
with your customer segments. It's always more economical to keep a customer than it is to always be seeking out new customers. It's a long-term investment that is worthwhile compared to always trying to seek out new customers. And you're always in that initial awareness phase. And, and that's it can be costly in the long term. So think about what is the bond that you want to establish. And then we, we talk about the, the fourth, the third team theme is the intimacy of the relationship. Is it personal or is it automated? And this is where you have to think about your five different uh, phases during channels. And how are those touch points? Are they personal where customers deal with the same person always and it's called high touch? Or is it automated where customers deal with machines, computers, with systems, point of sale systems, um, and that's called low touch. And so some of the faces may be personal where they deal, deal directly with you or your, um, your team in order to see the products or to get to know about the services. But then once the sales is made, the delivery may be automated or the, the sales part may be automated. And so you have to think about, okay, what is the type of the, the intimacy of relationship within these five different phases? Is it gonna be personal where they always deal with us within each of the five phases? Or is it automated where they, they will deal with a machine, with a computer in some of the phases? So you have to think about that and think about how is that gonna be established uh, for your business model. And then the fourth theme is the relationship life cycle. And within the relationship life cycle, you have to think about the acquisition strategies, retention strategies, and cross-selling strategies. Acquisition strategies, you how do you get customers? And that's the during the awareness phase. And so you have to think about what are the strategies gonna be in order during this whole relationship life cycle in the acquisition uh, strategies. And then during retention strategies, how do you keep customers? And then once they are within your brick and mortar store or they are on your website and they are ready to buy, can you cross sell? So you have to think about cross selling strategies. How do you sell more to your customers? So if you, your business is about uh, selling um, uh, formal wear for men, such as suits. Your goal would be for them, not just to leave with a suit, but to leave with a tie, with a, an, a shirt, uh, would leave with uh, other aspects uh, that other uh, products that may go with a, such as a belt, or socks. And so you have to think about, okay, how can you cross sell? How can you upsell to your customer segments? So you have to think about strategies for each of these three phases, the acquisition phase, retention phase, and the cross selling phase or upselling phase. So you have to think about how are you going to go about establishing this life cycle from beginning and taking them into upsell. And we can see that with uh, software, with apps, how they sometimes they start us up with a free app. And then we, we start using the app so much and we integrate it into our business. And we find out that there are certain areas that we can get access that would be very beneficial for us as a small business. Well, then we check uh, on their site and we know 
and we see that we have to pay in order to get access to those characteristics of the app. And so they start to cross sell, they start to upsell to us, adding on uh, features. Even within paid software, a very good example would be uh, for those of us who use uh, QuickBooks. And QuickBooks comes with a very basic model. And then if you want payroll, if you want other aspects about HR, if you want uh, about invoicing and checking and other, those are added on services. So it's an upsell or cross-sell strategy that Intuit, uh, the company of QuickBooks has in order for us to continue to buy from them. And so we have to think about these three phases, the acquisition, the retention and the cross-selling. And our third building block that we will talk about is revenue streams. And we talked about this last week and we, we talked about how these four building blocks that we have talked about two last week and two this week are where your revenues come, the streams come through. So your value proposition, your customer segments, through your channels, through your customer relationships, bring in the funding, bring in the finances into your company. And that's revenue streams come in through these four building blocks. And we talked about how these four building blocks are what your customer segments can see about your business model. This is the part where your customer segments can see. This is the exterior. This is, as we compared it last week to a theater, it's from the curtain outward toward the audience. Everything that the customer segments can see. So this is the visual part of your business model. And next week we will see behind the scenes, behind the curtains uh, on the four uh, building blocks that are on your left side. And so today we're talking about revenue streams and revenue streams is how you earn money from a customer segment and how your business model captures value in return for creating and delivering customer value. And it is the outcome of your choices in regard to value proposition, customer segments, channels, and customer relationships. Ideally, revenue streams should always be bigger than the cost structure, but it is understood that first year, second year, even third year, this may not be true because during the first, second, and third year, you have investments. You have investments in equipment. You have investments in inventory. You have investments in brick and mortar. You have investments in other aspects of your business, which eventually you will be getting back through the revenue streams but it does take time. So that's why initially the revenue streams may not be bigger than the cost structure, but the end goal of all small businesses is for the cost structure to be larger than your revenue stream. And we're just gonna mention these types of revenue streams. Uh, most small businesses are asset sales. And they are generated from the transfer of ownership rights of a tangible or intangible asset. And we're talking about products or services. And so you somebody buys it and you transfer the product, the service to your customer segment. And that is, that is what is called asset sales. That the majority of the small businesses 
are this type of small business model. And then we have rental fees. And rental fees are generated by temporary granting someone the exclusive right to use a particular physical asset for a fixed period in return for a fee. And rental fees we could see with cars, we could see with equipment, if you're gonna do some construction work, or even if you're gonna do some yard work and you go and rent out a machine. And so this is where this type of uh, revenue stream uh, is very popular. And then we have usage fee. Usage fee is generated by use of a particular service. The more the service is used, the more the customer pays. And so this is very, the, the system, the revenue stream that uh, utility companies use um, in order to sell us uh, gas, electricity, water. This is the, the usage fee. And then um, now I'm gonna age myself by mentioning this, but a years past when internet just started, usage fee was the revenue type of revenue stream where you could only use certain amount of megabytes per month. And then phones, phones, cell phones were the same. You could only use so, use so much of your phone and you could only text so many texts per month. And, and, and the phone systems, the cell, cell phone companies and internet were based on usage fee. Now it, it has expanded and the usage fees have expanded. Uh, they are larger uh, quantities of, uh, of, of, of how you can use internet and, and how you can stream. But um, this is uh, uh, the, the type of revenue stream that was very popular in the past. And then we have licensing fees. And this is generated by giving customers permission to use protected intellectual property in exchange for licensing fees. And uh, most of us are very, very familiar with the licensing fees in regard to college football or to professional sports and how um, the, the names of the teams, uh, the logos of the teams are licensed. Another area that we have seen it through the years um, is through McDonald's and their Happy Meals. And we, when a movie is gonna come out and McDonald's comes out with a Disney character or from another movie. And so licensing fees have to be paid. Also t-shirt designs and then other areas, especially with uh, uh, musical groups uh, within rock, pop, um, it's very popular about the licensing fees. And so there are, uh, this is uh, another type of revenue stream. And then we have advertising fee. Advertising fee is very popular in social media companies such as Facebook and other uh, social media because that's how they generate revenue streams because they have two types of customer segments. One is the customer segment, such as us who are the users, but then they have another customer segment, which is the, the advertising com com the companies that advertise and sell, uh, they buy, I mean, advertising from these social media companies. And so the, the social media companies have to think about how to generate revenue streams. And they do it through advertising. And if us as entrepreneurs want to also uh, be advertised or be marketed through Facebook or Instagram or other types of social media, we do have to pay a fee also in order for us to reach out to a certain amount of people uh, in a certain area or type of demographics. So we, 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 we also can use that as a small business 
In the past, advertising fees were also very, very popular within radio, TV, and newsprint, such as uh, newspapers. Uh, we have seen this uh, die off as social media has gained strength and popularity. But uh, within small communities, um, newspapers are still very popular. And it's one of the best ways for your customer segment to get to know about what you sell if you are new to that community. And so uh, the printed newspaper is very popular still with the small, within the smaller communities. <clears throat> and then we have sub subscription fees. And this is uh, another one that this is one type of revenue stream that has been increasing in popularity. Um, I have seen this uh, very popular within the local farm uh, business model where local farms start up a subscription fee. They start up an app and within that app, people can select what products they want could be fruits, could be vegetables, could be meats, could be uh, dairy products, could be flour products and, and other uh, products. And then the local farmer will come and deliver a crate, um, be it weekly, be it monthly, uh, depending on how we set up our subscription. And this, um, what it, it, it does is help the local farmers and uh, you, what is uh, eliminated is the distributors. And so it's direct from farm to table. And, and this is a new model that is being used more and more. So what we have seen is local farms that uh, make agreements or alliances with other local farms because one farm, their niche may be cre creating flour, uh, could be grain, um, corn flour, wheat flour, other types of flour. Then there might be another um, farm that uh, their, their specialty are meats. And then there may be another farm that may, their specialty may be dairy. And then this one farm, their specialty may be vegetables and some fruits in certain seasons. And so they get together, establish a subscription fee, and their products are sold locally within the local cities, such as Des Moines, such as Ames, such as Ankeny, where young professionals or just families that are, that are want to support local products, um, establish these subscriptions and they receive their crates every every week every two weeks every month depending on how they establish that subscription and so that's one way i've seen subscription another subscription fee that i have seen was within even the physical fitness uh business model where people were couldn't go to gyms so they started subscriptions in order to receive one-on-one -on -one training uh, from trainers on, 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 uh, on for physical fitness, for wellness. And we see that within that uh, business model. We also see it within other service types of business models um, in wellness and uh, other types where there are subscription fees. And then we also see it even, I talked about uh, QuickBooks and QuickBooks, uh, the online version offers subscription fee. Now there is the software QuickBooks where you buy it for one, uh, one, one payment, but that's the version that you keep. So if it's a 2021 and then 2022, there's an update, you would have to update it. 
but if you have the subscription fee, your, your system, your QuickBooks system is always being updated, always uh, added on the new updates. So the subscription fees in software, in apps, have uh, an, an added uh, plus to it where you always have the updated version. And so it, think about your business models. Is there a way where you can establish a subscription fee um, where people will come and they will subscribe and they will receive something from your business on a monthly basis? or a quarterly basis and just think about it. And that's a one, uh, one of the revenue streams that I really like to highlight that is very, very uh, being used a lot. And then we have the brokerage fee. Brokerage fee really is uh, used within real estate and uh, within uh, uh, investment companies um, because uh, they are, uh, uh, services of intermediation uh, between two or more parties, uh, buying a home or buying stocks and bonds and investments. And then we, we have to think about the pricing mechanism. The pricing mechanism is how the price is established and it's always tied to a revenue stream. So there are two different types of pricing mechanism. There's static pricing, it's fixed in advance or dynamic, fixed on the spot. When we talk about static, um, we like with car dealers, there is a list price, feature dependent, uh, uh, volume dependent, and segment dependent, but there is a static pr uh, pricing for cars. Now, if we're gonna talk about dynamics, we can talk about negotiation. And negotiation is, negotiation is one of the oldest systems a uh, pricing mechanism that they have existed for a long time. And if you go to Latin America, if you go to Africa, if you go even to Asia, this system is very much in use. Um, you can go to my native country, I'm from Mexico. And if you go even to a furniture store, uh, people will not be offended if you try to negotiate a better price on a product because it, it, it is still popular within um, these uh, areas. Um, here in the United States, we've gotten back, uh, we've left that negotiation system pretty much and it's more static fixed pricing. But uh, if you go to Latin America, you go to Africa, you go to Asia um, in certain parts, negotiation is still a very, popular revenue stream. And then we have yield management, and this is more um, uh, for farming, for perishable resources, and then we have real-time market. Uh, this is how some utility companies uh, set up the pricing on electricity, and we saw this uh, come to be very true. Um, it was uh, uh, more than a year ago, when in Texas, the electricity system fell. And so those very few places that ha still had electricity, the real-time marketplace just fluctuated and, and prices just raised uh, so much because it was based on real-time markets. And people got bills of 2,000, 3,000 or more uh, dollars uh, for the usage of the regular electricity, just because of the real time market. And then we have the auction system. Auction system are is still a very popular system. And we see that uh, especially when there is a sale of land or a sale of vehicles or sale of, uh, of, uh, of a real estate property, um, and this system is still very popular. And then what we have to think about when we're thinking about revenue streams is to make sure you clearly define who is paying and for what value. Avoid orphan revenue streams. When I talk about orphan revenue streams is within your business model, within revenue streams, you might put 
that you are going to receive revenue streams from advertising but then up in your in your value proposition and in your customer segments you never specify what customer segment is going to pay for that re, uh, advertising for that uh, revenue stream and so you have to specify it. and then choosing the right revenue stream and pricing mechanism can make a fundamental difference to your business and experiment with different possibilities and that's why i mentioned about the subscription uh revenue stream which has been uh has been becoming very popular as we go forward especially when uh, uh, a lot of our business models are online and uh, people have access through social media or through websites or through zoom or video conferencing. And so we can set up a subscription fee based revenue stream. And to finish up, I just want to remind remember, it's about creating value, delivering value, and capturing value. And with that, I am going to stop sharing. Well, let me just show you one example um before i stop sharing and i just wanted to share this one this is a disruptive shaving company and i just wanted to show um how uh how this disruptive shaving company um came and disrupted the the business the typical business model because in the past shaving men's shaving products were sold through a walmart through a Walgreens, through a high V, through a department store, and the customer segments bought it on location in a brick and mortar big box uh, store. But this disruptive shaving company, it is it created the, the same uh, men's shaving products, but it created a customer relationship that was direct and it went through online stores and it was sold through viral videos on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook, but it was direct to the customer segments, the mass men's market. And it was based, uh, the revenue stream was based on customized subscription, where you have these shaving products delivered to you on a monthly basis, or depending on how you establish your subscription. And this was a disruptive store. So within your business models, always think about how can you disrupt the, the status quo, the way things are have always been done within your business model, but within your business sector type of business, um, be it products or be it services, what could you add on to make it unique, to make it different, to make it stand out? So think about it. And I just wanted to share this example before we, we stop sharing. Okay, so before we give you 20 minutes for you to work on your channels, on your customer relationships, and your revenue streams are there any questions 